Avian influenza virus has a single-stranded negative sense RNA genome divided into eight different segments, all coding for at least one protein. Extraction of RNA is the first step of molecular avian influenza diagnosis. During the procedure, the operator should be protected by a lab coat and wear protective sleeves and gloves to avoid any contact of reagents with the skin. Particular attention should be paid to putting on the gloves without touching the outer surfaces in order to prevent contact with residues of RNAs from the operator's hands. At this stage, as the sample has not yet been added to the lysis buffer, the virus is still potentially infectious and the operator may increase his safety by wearing a filter face mask. Extra care should be taken when working with suspected zoonotic pathogens. In diagnostic laboratories, RNA extraction is commonly performed using commercial kits. Commercial RNA extraction kits are generally based on the same principles and should be used following the manufacturer's instructions. In this video, RNA extraction using a glass fiber filter based method will be presented. Begin the work session by marking the tubes with the corresponding sample identification number. The extraction procedure starts with the lysis of the tissue in order to free the nucleic acid from the cells. This is done by adding the sample to the lysis buffer provided in the kit, according to the proportions recommended by the manufacturer. This buffer contains reagents such as guanidine and triton X that destroy cells, denature proteins, inactivated RNases and create appropriate binding conditions that favour the absorption of RNA to the silica membrane. Dispense the required volume of lysis buffer into each tube, remembering that guanidine is harmful by inhalation, in contact with skin and if swallowed. In some kits, the addition of ethanol is required to adjust RNA binding conditions. Addition of the sample is now required. Note that for each batch of samples, a negative control should be included by adding phosphate buffered saline to the lysis buffer instead of the sample. The correct amount of homogenized tissue under examination is now added to the lysis buffer. From now on the operator can continue to work without the face mask as the virus is no longer infectious. Vortex the solution in order to homogenize reagents and to avoid pelleting of any precipitate in the tube. Load the lysate onto a silica membrane column provided, which absorbs nucleic acids. Identify each column with the identification number of the sample. Dispense the lysate into the middle of the column, making sure that the filters are not touched by the tips in order to avoid breaking the glass fibers. Since this is a high risk contamination procedure, it is strongly recommended that one tube is opened at a time and to change tips after each sample in order to avoid transfer of RNA by contaminated tips. Remember to change gloves before leaving the hood. Centrifugation is now performed to allow absorption of nucleic acids to the filter. The duration and speed of the centrifugation are set according to the manufacturer's instructions. Now return to the hood and prepare new collection tubes into which the column will be placed for the next step of the procedure. Discard the flow through into the waste vessel. In certain kits a desalting buffer is used to render DNA's digestion more effective. It is crucial to change tips in dispensing reagents from one sample to another in order to avoid contamination of the stock solution. To avoid this risk, it is strongly recommended that aliquots of the stock solution of each reagent are prepared. A second centrifugation is now necessary to remove the desalting buffer and to wash away any salt and proteins. 
The sample is now ready for DNA's digestion. During this step, total DNA present in the sample is degraded and only the total RNA of the sample remains on the filter. The DNA's reaction mixture is prepared according to the manufacturer's instructions in a single tube for all samples and then dispensed into each single column. Incubation for 15 minutes at room temperature is necessary for the reaction. Note that this reagent may cause sensitization by inhalation and skin contact. Additional washing and drying steps are now performed using washing buffers specifically developed to remove salts, metabolites and macromolecular cellular components from the RNA sample. Remember that all these washing reagents contain guanidine, which is harmful by inhalation in contact with skin and if swallowed. After washing, RNA elution is now possible. Prepare nuclease-free collection tubes that have been properly identified in order to collect the RNA eluate and to store it. Place each column into the nuclease-free collection tube and discard the flow through from the final wash into the correct waste vessel. Elution of RNA is done by adding RNA's free water. The water dissolves the low ionic binding between the silica membrane and the nucleic acid. After a final centrifugation, the RNA is eluted and the extraction is completed. The total RNA of the sample is collected in the tube. The eluate should be treated with care because RNA is very sensitive to trace contaminations of RNases often found on general lab wear, fingerprints and dust. To ensure RNA stability, store the RNA at minus 70 degrees Celsius. At the end of each nucleic acid extraction session, it is very important to clean the hood and the equipment properly. Leave the equipment that was in contact with the sample in disinfectant solution overnight. Note that a longer period in the solution will compromise the equipment due to the corrosive power of the disinfectant solution. Clean the bench and the pipettes with a 0.5% solution of sodium hypochlorite. Due to the corrosive characteristics of this solution, wash it away with a 70% solution of alcohol. After the last working session of the day, it is strongly recommended that the cleaned pipettes are placed in a clean box outside of the hood in order to avoid the effect of the UV light on the plastic and the consequent loss of accuracy of the instrument. Now the hood can be closed. The UV light should be left on for at least 8 hours in order to degrade any traces of nucleic acid on the working surface.